with Alexandra in conversation tonight is friend of Booksmith, Alexis Coe. Alexis is the New York Times bestselling author of You Never Forget Your First, a biography of George Washington, and was a consulting producer on, as well as appeared in Doris Cairns Goodwin's George Washington series on the History Channel. And Alexandra Petri is an American humorist and newspaper columnist at the Washington Post. She lives in Washington, DC. Um, if you have any questions for the authors um, tonight, please put your questions in the comments and we'll have time for a Q&A at the end of the program. Alexis and Alexandra, thank you both so much for joining us. Um, I will uh, turn it over to y'all now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm so excited to be here. It was an honor to be asked to do this. Um, and of course, we're talking to um, one of the great humorists, I think, of our time. And, uh, but this is a weird format. We don't quite get the same like energy or feel that we do when we're in person. And so um, she has no idea this is happening. So this is the way to horrify her at the very beginning. Um, <laughs> can I ask you like five questions, lightning round, and then we'll get to the traditional book questions. And hopefully I won't ask the same questions that everyone asks when we get there. But this is a lightning round. I'm just going to give you two options and you tell me which is better or which you prefer. Ooh, okay, I guess I'm as ready as I'm ever gonna be. History books or monuments? You can only have one. History books. All right, patriots or traitors? Ooh, well this seems pretty straightforward, so I'm gonna go with patriots. Like, mm -hmm. unless like New England patriots, that's a team that I have no affiliation with, um, but they, people like them, I hear. I guess it's straightforward. Old Testament or New Testament? Oh, mm, I, I like both of them. Both of them I like about the same. I think anyone who has even glanced at the book, up right side or upside down, would know that they're both about equivalent. Uh, there's nothing really that distinguishes one from the other in tone or in attitude, so I would say both. All right, fair. The American Revolution or the Civil War? Ooh, I, I think I, I like Civil War. All right, yeah, seems to be in vogue. Melania or Ivanka? Oh, I, mm. This is yeah. the tough one. It's, I guess, hmm. <laughs> it's sort of like, they, they both get a lot of attention in the book. I think, I think I'm gonna go with Melania just because I like the, the things I've written about her better <laughs> from an entirely, <laughs> Yeah. 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 So, okay, so now we'll get to the real actual questions in which you can answer them in, in as many words or sentences as you would like, because oh, this wow. is, after all, a celebration of your book. Um, and I think, you know, we all read you frequently. You write these essays five times a week, which sounds incredible to me. I write really, really slowly. Um, and, but I would imagine, I, I sort of want to go back quite a bit and ask when you started writing satire? Ooh, I, honestly, I started, that was one of the first things I sort of wrote. Uh, when I was in like high school, I started this humor magazine called The Perturbed Squirrel. And it was all just like, what's a, it, some of it was more subtle than others. I had this like, you can, I'm dating myself now, but it was like, Bush announces plans for war on weather. And uh, it, that's sort of a like a very specific, like, oh, maybe like I can do the onion at home. And so, it, it, I don't know, it was like, I always, I grew up reading and loving the onion. And so I was like, maybe this is something I could do. And like, your first efforts are always sort of, oh, I see now that like, this isn't always gonna work, but you get gradually, you sort of see that it is possible to do. And every time you get that little sort of pellet of success, it makes you want to do it more and more. And you're like, oh, I, there was something there and I can maybe get to the next platform using a video game metaphor, I assume. Whatever else you jump from platform to platform on. I, that, it's story checks out to me. Um, <laughs> and did you write this in a vacuum or did you like hand it out around school? Did you try and get like feedback about it? Did you email the onion and say, what do you think? Oh man, no, I actually, I handed it out around school and uh, the funny thing was, so I went to an all girls school and so the first one was like, we were like, we've admitted our first boy and all the like fourth graders were crying. They're like, oh no, like we thought <laughs> this was, this, we were, and it, I found this like very dorky picture of this like dude in glasses who was like, he was going to be the first 
and he was just excited and they were they were not excited about it and so i had to explain to the fourth graders that this was not in fact occurring but mostly like we sort of had to run it by like one teacher but she was excited enough by the concept that she wasn't going to be like oh no like ho hold up there because it was it was weird because like also it was during like the the, the dc sniper and, and like a lot of very stressful stuff was going on and so it was also funny because at the time i was like our this is very stressful and also our school's response to it seems not ideal that they were like we're gonna have one teacher sort of follow you from classroom to classroom outdoors and i'm like how is that going to what so it was the same underlying urge to be like something's not right here maybe i can make a joke about it that will explain that that's that's good. And so, so these fourth grade girls that came up to you really worried. They were like, she is, you know, this is who I issue my complaints to. Um, do you see an iteration of those fourth graders in your inbox now who are taking you literally? Well, the worst thing is when people take you, like, yeah, like uh, seriously and literally, as opposed to literally but not seriously or neither seriously nor literally. I, the worst ones are when you get somebody who's like, Finally, somebody says it. Like, and I, I always was joking that like, uh, you know, when Jonathan Swift wrote his thing, I wonder if he got a bunch of notes from people being like, hey, finally somebody had the courage to say what I've always been thinking we should do to those Irish babies, namely eat them. them. Yeah. yeah. And like, you just, I'm glad that you had the courage to put it out there and just keep it up, keep up the good work, bro. Because I feel like based on my inbox, there, that is out there, uh, there's like, Poe's law dictates that like no opinion you express on the internet it can be so completely wild that somebody isn't sincerely espousing it. So you have to try to like in everything put a, a little moment where you pop out and say, hey, no, hold on a second, just in case somebody's only reading it in a vacuum and doesn't know that you usually write jokes or doesn't know what your vibe is. So hopefully you get as few of those emails as you possibly can. And, and do you feel like this is not the first president you've written about or written through. Um, and in past times, there have been um, moments in which comedians have been accused of like going too far, um, you know, making fun of a president, sort of parroting something they said and, and, and transgressing these bounds of normalcy and decency. But then there's Trump and that's like his whole thing. So. So then how, how do you negotiate that? I mean, does that even occur to you? I mean, I know I think always as a biographer, as a historian, I want to be fair. I, I want to like really think about this and, um, you know, I'm a, I have all these sets of concerns, but, but sometimes it, in certain situations, like they're not relevant. So, so do you have, do you wonder, am I going too far? Am I not going far enough because he pushes so far? Is it just a different way of thinking about writing about a president right now? It is a little bit because as you say, he's the one who's sort of doing all the stuff that they used to be like comedians are like taking it too far and they're like making jokes that hurt people. And like, he's sitting there doing his sort of like strange shtick where he's like making fun of people and constantly, uh, but also not just is he making jokes that are like making fun of people and sort of using insults and like using racist language continually, but he's also doing actions that have like tangible negative impacts at all of the time. So it's weird where it's sort of like, is this in the realm of like speech and politeness or is this in the realm of like something is going on that is actively horrible and harmful to people. And so uh, like, because I feel like once it enters the realm of like real people, that's where I'm concerned. I'm not like, oh my God, am I going too hard on Donald Trump? It's like, are we losing sight of like what he's doing because he's being such a wild clown? And I, I think sometimes uh, we, we, that's one of my favorite, I think tweets of all time where it's like saying like, who is this clown is funny because it implies that like, not only is the person a clown, but they're not even one of the better known clowns. I forget who said it, but it's one of, I, I just love that joke. And I feel like that's, you know, you want to not be so constantly focused on what did President Trump say today? Because it's also like, well, he's the president. So probably it's relevant to people that he said it. Uh, and so I feel like, is there something else I could be writing about? So I try to not always be like drawn to the magnet spotlight yeah. thing. 
She said, the no, just the on the shoulder motion was, but I'm, I, I committed to it. Anyway, now, oh, now I've commented on it, thereby taking the focus of the camera back to myself from you where it had gone, so I could have just not commented. It. And I'm continuing to talk. Wow, fascinating. Uh, I like it. I like it. Wait, so so it's like this thing where every, all, I mean, it's, it's Trump's America, so all of our rules are different. All of our rules for living are different, um, but also sort of the discipline that you have as a writer is slightly different because what you're trying to do is not, um, I mean, you're wading through all this stuff and you're watching people. I mean, you're watching the media, which is really frustrating as, as an American, you're watching them just run after everything that he, it's like everything that he throws. It's sort of like, um, you know, when you have a dog who will play catch until they die. Um, <laughs> You know, like it just, sometimes it feels like that where you're like, wait, why are you chasing every single ball when there's this just really important thing that obviously he's trying to distract from? Yeah, so you're, years, we it's like, yeah. George Washington dog joke. Sorry, I, I, just, I, I wanted sweet to throw the George Washington dog sweet lips reference. But he's very generously trying to block my buck. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, it's like, it's this thing where you were, there is, um, I was saying that like you write five columns a, a, a week, I think, and that's sort of my nightmare because I just, it's too much. And, um, but at the same time, what you're trying to do is you have so much material. You're just trying to focus on it and say like, wait, even though this other ridiculous thing happened and maybe it's really funny and I could have a field day with it, I, I have to really think about like, which group of people is being um, most affected by this or, or what are the long-term ramifications of this um, rather than this side. So, so you're sort of like weighing that. And it's also because one of the people come to the Trump era with a couple of attitudes and sometimes they're like, well, the lesson of this is that like, you don't need to have any standards because look at him, he's the president. And I feel like actually the lesson of him as the president is that you do and it's helpful to continue maintaining certain standards and like be like, he can behave this way, and that doesn't mean everyone should behave this way. In fact, quite the opposite, because we can just see how bad it is when somebody who's in charge of everything uh, is behaving the way that he's behaving. And it's it sort of, some people are like, no, like, he's, we, it's just like, no, maybe, like, the opposite lesson actually is what we should be taking. So it's like, let's get more experts in, when people who aren't, like, my gut told me that my son-in-law probably, if he read 27 books, would just solve the Middle East. And I'm like, fewer people like that, and more people who treat others with respect and humanity, which is like, uh, I don't know, a very lukewarm take, uh, right. room temperature. But, a, but very necessary in this day and age. Um, and when you get things like, so all the things, that you, it's interesting because when I read some of the essays, um, I, I, what I did was I read them, I did like my impression of you, <laughs> which I, I love. If you don't follow her on Twitter, you need to because Alexandra does uh, many, many hilarious things. But one of my favorite that she's been doing during quarantine is, um, and at other times, but, but in particular, I think there were like two or three days where you did quite a bit. I felt really rich. But where she would like pick up a book, say like a fine looking book like this, and <laughs> he would then describe it, War and Peace, something like that. And, um, and you, you, I, I'm, I'm sort of getting lost in it, but, but you have this like voice where you're, you're, you know, you're, you're doing a bit and it's funny. And, and so I read, um, some of your essays, like just the first paragraph in that voice. And it, you know, I read it as it's supposed to be interpreted. And the one that I kept coming back to where it was stark was how to sleep at night when families are being separated at the border. And you can read that start, you know, in, in sort of a, a comical way, and you can read it sarcastically and make, you know, good, funny voices. And then you read it straight, and it made me well up. It's, it's exactly like your essays can be read both ways. They're the most poignant critiques. And they're also very funny. Um, but I wonder, like, how do you get there? Because I have this range of emotion when I read your writing, and there are all these different ways that I can that I can take it. And I know when I, um, when I, when people ask me to write something relevant to what's happening, I have to sort of go through like almost the stages of 
like grief, you know, like when you, when you, you first denial, you weren't expecting this and then you have to sort of acclimate yourself to it. And then you have to get, how do you get to that place from, this is totally outrageous and I'm so mad to, okay, this is funny. Or do you immediately see the dark humor? I feel like uh, in my actual life as a human, and my husband can testify to this, sometimes when I'm just like really depressed or like think of something awful, I'll just start sort of laughing in like a low, miserable way. And I feel like that's sort of like deep, unhappy chuckle, uh, which it's not as I'm like, I'll be laughing and he'll be like, why, what, what? And I'll say, oh, I'm just laughing. And he'll say, well, y yes, so <laughs> what are you laughing at? And I'll have to be like, well, I just thought about the inevitability of death or like, you know, everyone we love is going to die. <laughs> and just sort of like, it's a, it, in a way there's like a moment of like acknowledging something, knowing you can't do anything about it. And there's, I don't know, but I, I feel like a lot of my writing lives in the space between like hoping that you can do something about it. And also like, cause there's this weird valence, like the one you pointed out, uh, how to sleep at night because sometimes there are people and there are certain like like you see especially online who are like able to say things and sort of not hear how it sounds and like trying to both like because you can occupy this register where you're like well like it's easy you can sort of breeze on by it and like sort of roll up your window at the suffering that you're passing and trying to be like, no, but you can, do you hear yourself? And trying to like write it in such a way that you can like hear both of the things where it's like somebody might plausibly be saying this, uh, but also you can hear like beneath it, just like how cruel it is. So trying to, I, I love writing things in a voice that isn't necessarily mine. Like my favorite genre of book to read, as you saw me like waving my books around is something where like somebody tells you a whole story as though they are the hero of it and you gradually realize that they're the villain. I just love that. Especially like, I, I often feel like some of my friends' coworkers have just very different stories of what their work life is like. Uh, not to be like my friend, no, but sometimes you hear a story and you're like, I really wonder what like the version of this same story that somebody else is telling sounds like. And so sometimes getting into that voice, like I just read Rousseau's Confessions and oh my gosh, he dropped off five children at a foundling hospital, and he's just like, Diderot had it in for me, and furthermore, David Hume was out for my life, but I don't have time to tell you why, and I'm just like, this man is a, wow, he's, he's a strange, strange fella, um, but he, he, like, sort of a classic example of, like, somebody telling you something with full confidence that they're going to be in total sympathy with you, and just saying increasingly outrageous, horrible things, uh, I, I, I feel like there's, like, a lot of if you could puncture that, that you, you can do a lot of work in that spot. Yeah, completely, completely. That's, um, and then, so <laughs> do you ever sort of burn out of this, this fresh hell? Like, do you ever just think like, I, ca I can't, I need to take this week off or, you know, I just, like, does yeah, that ever happen to you? Often, <laughs> this has been a week yeah. when I've just been like, I can't like, I've been, I was like looking at everything I've been writing and I was like, huh, this is all in list format and, it's, and none of it's more than 500 words long. Like, could it be that my brain is telling me something? Uh, but, cause part of the, like the gift of having a platform is you get to write about what's going on, but also it means that you have to write about what's going on. And so like, I, I'm also, like, but you can take breaks. I, like, I, I hate to, I'm like, the week I go on vacation will be the one week that everything in America changes. And then 2020 happens and you're like, well, that's literally a statement that could be true. Like that keeps, there keep being weeks like that. Um, so, but I, I yeah, it, it, it does happen. And I think you also have to be kind to yourself. So I'm gonna probably take next week off. <laughs> so, so good idea, that's a, yeah. Um, so I think, um, I have these all out of order because I got so excited and then I was like, one A, one B. Oh man. <laughs> Worked out as well as I thought it would. Um, what's your research process like? Are you reading, you, you sort of already answered this, uh, that you try to channel the person and you try to 
become their voice. But like, so you, you obviously uh, run into McConnell quite a bit in your work, for example. Are you also then like reading books about him or I don't know, I'm sure he's written one, um, written. And do you, do you then do that? Do you want a lot of information or at a certain point are you like, no, I, I don't want to actually know that much more about McConnell, for example. I think sometimes I'm like, well, what am I trying to say? Am I like trying to like do a like deeply, richly realized psychological portrait of Mitch McConnell? And if the answer is yes, then I'm like, okay, I got to get those books out. I got to do a deep dive. And if I'm like, somebody said something on Tuesday, but I think if you unpacked it is deeply contradictory and very absurd. And hopefully if people notice that, then they'll stop it from going any further then sometimes you're like, okay, well, how do I get the tone as much as I possibly can? And so then it's like a question of like reading, like to get like the voice, like the p to pick up the voice of the person that you're trying to emulate. Or like if I was trying to do something film noir -y or like regular noir -y, I would like break out the Raymond Chandler and just like, because I feel like whatever I'm reading, that's what comes out when I'm writing. So if I want to sound a certain way, I have to also be putting that in as much as possible, which can be bad if you're like reading, uh, you know, an, like an author who just has a very distinctive tone because then suddenly you're just like, he walked into the bar and it was a smoky bar and there were several dames there and boy golly, they looked like something you'd find inside a roll of paper towel, but without the bounty uh, or something. And you're just like, yeah. this isn't how I want my writing to sound. I'd better read some Chaucer or, or some sort of palate cleanser or something. Uh, what's his What's his name? Uh, Mr. Mr. Bad. Um, Ezra Pound. Ezra Pound said that if you, <laughs> sorry to this Ezra Pound, um, <laughs> he, he was always like, well, if you need a palate cleanser from an author, just read Chaucer and then your writing will just sound like normal default writing because nobody will sound like Chaucer after reading Chaucer. Uh, Fair. Yes. That's a hot Ezra Pound content coming to you fresh. I was just imagining you, um, is it Middle English or is it, I can't remember now. I think it's Middle, yes. And, and one that Avril with his shoulders saw to the draught of Mars that pairs it to the rota, that sort of thing. I knew you could do it. So then I guess the other question I is- I see myself you, up to that, really, no. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I was like, yeah. You read widely, that's very clear. And as I said, and I'm now sort of, inter, you know, outing myself as like a bit of a stalker, but you're reading, fiction, you're reading nonfiction, you're reading history. It's just all over the place in a way that I don't normally see, except, you know, with, with like Danny Mallory Ortberg, for example. It just doesn't, you know, you're also watching shows, like it's just, it's, it, the variety is sort of staggering. And so I'm curious, you know, what is in your, I don't want to say media appetite, but like in the last, you know, 12 hours or whatever, like what books have you read? What um, things have you consumed? What have you watched? Oh man, what? so I've been reading The Count of Monte Cristo because I've never actually read it. And I'm like, I want to have a nice, I, I, I've been like, let's get the big, I, after I read War and Peace, I'm like, okay, there, no book is too long. I no longer have the excuse that this is too long and I don't want to read it. Um, so Count of Monte Cristo is off to a good start. He's having a great wedding. It looks like there are going to be no obstacles put in his way, and he certainly won't be arrested for a crime he has not committed. So excited for this young Edmond Dantes fellow who's going to go far. Um, and what else? I, well, I always read the print newspaper comics, just like religiously every day. Uh, that's, I, then I read like the rest of the newspaper because that's important. But I always am like, Let's, I, I even read Judge Parker and like, I don't know, I tr although the person who writes like Sally Forth took over Judge Parker and also the person who wrote, I could pee on this, like the book about what your cat's really thinking. So now it's like funnier. It's like the, still the same amount of drama, but everyone's like also making jokes of the dialogue. So anyway, I have a lot of opinions on that front. I've been trying, I also picked up some Raymond Chandler again recently because I noticed that I had like 40 pages to go. There was all this one story at the end of The Simple Art of Murder, which I love how he just starts that off being like, no, you know what? That Dorothy Sayers doesn't know a thing about writing mysteries and I will tell you what. And I'm like, literally, I've never understood a single one of your plots. It doesn't matter because the writing is so good, but truly, I don't know what's going on. Um, what else? I've been consuming Voyager because I've never watched Voyager. Uh, I've watched all the rest of Star Trek in, and 
like I love the original series, love New Space Nine, and like Next Generation is just a workplace where people get along really well, and that's which is wonderful. But also, like, where is the drama? So I'm I'm also liking Voyager, which is mostly a workplace where people get along really well. But also, you've got Captain Janeway, and uh, she's terrific, and also in the Doctor. So I'm enjoying that very much, and I haven't gotten to Seven of Nine yet, but I hear good things. What else have I been? I'm trying to think, I have this like, I also have a deep fondness for like very strange, oddly specific primary sources that will never come up again and will just only be, only serve to addle me and confuse me. So yeah. I've got this book of like, uh, it's actually, is it my, oh, I was hoping it would be right behind me and it was going to be a great reveal, but I don't, it actually, it, it got put away, but I had like the Victorian Underground, which is just a series of accounts that this guy did where he just went and interviewed people who were in like the underbelly of Victorian London and was like, how did you get here? What was your life like? And it was fascinating. But then like all the specifics of like, here's how you could pick someone's pocket, which should have been fascinating, but compared to like all these narratives where they're like, I came to the city, I was told I'd have like a really good, easy job. And then it turned out that they wanted uh, me to do sex work, which is not what I came here to do. So it was, it was very like, it felt surprisingly modern, but also, yeah, you know, so I don't know what I'm going to do with that information, but if you want to know more about, like, the sad lives of people down and out in Vic Victorian London, that's, that's the book. Uh, I got into these, um, these books that have never been published um, by women in, like, the 18th century and, and such, um, and there was this, I loved women who claimed that they uh, fought in the Mexican-American War, that they cross-dressed and they fought in the war because we have no documentation of any women fighting in that war. We have it from the revolution and every other war, except for that one. So I got what? really excited, oh, I'm on to this. Like I found her and every single one is just, it's it's just full of lies. But, but what I love is that um, you get sort of their thinking and you get, you, you find out like all of the, the and basically the punchline to every single book like this, which has, you know, 19 titles in them. They, the punchline is um, a woman, like it's always the same story. A woman is, it ends up, the problem is either she's going to lose her virginity to a, a you know, a terrible man or um, whatever it was, she should have just listened to her parents. That's like always, that's always the point of this story. And I'm never going to use these things, but I'm obsessed with them. I love them. It's like the, I had this book by, G, I'm now forgetting his name, but he like collected urban legends. And it felt very similar to like all, like the vanishing hitchhiker and like the choking Doberman. And just he has all these compilations and his are mostly from the eighties. And so a lot of them were like anxieties surrounding women working outside the home. And like, like my shoulder pads were too big and they crushed me. Like it could happen. Like that's sort of a, that, that's, not, that's just sort of an example that did not arise based in fact, but just all these things where it's like the babysitter, like here's the call from inside the house. And, it's, and he, so he goes through and he's like, what are people actually worried about when they're telling their friends these stories? And so I feel like, a lot of them in the Victorian one too, they were like, if I listened to my mother and I hadn't accompanied, oh, they, one of the jobs you could have was, so like you could just follow somebody around and make certain she didn't sell her clothes because her clothes were technically being like leased out. Like they had a lot of like sort of houses of ill repute. And so in, in some of them, like you would be your own agent, but in others, like you would literally have to like rent the clothes that you were wearing. Uh, and so one of the jobs that you could have once you, no longer were working was you would walk behind the person and make certain they didn't go and sell the clothes uh and so just like weird details like that that i, I don't know where they're going and i don't know why they were highlighted but uh you're in, now they're in my brain and i don't know what the capital of north dakota is anymore thanks to unless it's bismarck if it's bismarck i still know it but if not we're up a creek thanks so, yeah i would just say sioux falls but i think you're right um so what uh, you, I was gonna ask you a different question, but, but you brought up, you know, um, if you didn't have this job, what other, what else would you do? Ooh, I mean, I would love to just be like paid to just read all day. Uh, whenever I like the thing, I, I read this profile of like, when Gio Celentino's essay collection came out and she was just like, I read like 200 books a year or some like cartoonish number. And I was just like, 
wow, that's like, that's, I never read as much as I want to. And I, I try really hard to read a lot, but I, when I actually look at what it adds up to, it's like, you know, a lot of internet and not as much book wise, but I don't know. I feel like I'd love to write like a novel someday. That could be fun. Uh, and I think we would all like that. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm going to turn it over to everyone else. Uh, no, I lied. I'm going to ask two more questions. Sorry. And then I'll turn it over to you guys. Um, what, what does the Donald Trump presidential library look like? <laughs> well, I think or the, does, the Daily Show did a good parody of this, where it's just a bunch of framed tweets. But I feel like they should do something more sort of artsy and essential, like a, a boot stamping on a human face forever. To me, that's more the essence of like the Trump presidential library. Or, I mean, it couldn't have any books. Like that would be the first, the first rule would be no books. And the second rule would be that like you'd be charged to go in. It'd be sort of like P.T. Barnum's last stand where like you go in and there's all these signs that say like you're going to see stuff and you wind up having to pay a lot of money. And then at the end of it, you're just like, you know, oh man, it, it wasn't worth this. Do you know that it, there's nothing that guarantees that a president gets a presidential library? John Adams doesn't have a presidential library. James K. Polk doesn't. I know everyone's demanding this, but no, James they have, K. Polk have one. Does Millard Fillmore have one and Polk doesn't? Because that would feel wrong. I know no. that Benjamin Harrison has like a house because my family is obsessed with like we have like the two presidential factions in the, in the household where my mom is like team George Washington all the way and my aunt is team Benjamin Harrison all the way and like one Christmas we actually argued like you know who was the better president and it lasted a surprisingly long time given the basic parameters yeah. of the argument um That's but good. no because it turns out like Benjamin Harrison did a lot of like the national park stuff that Teddy Roosevelt gets credit for doing um and he had two pet opossums named Mr. Reciprocity and Mr. Protection. And that's got to count for something. Um, I don't know if I've ever heard anyone stan the Harrisons, which are the forgotten American dynasty. There were two presidents who were Harrisons from the same family. So that's amazing. I was um, trying to stake out like a claim as like, maybe I'd be a Benjamin Harrison and, uh, historian and I once I appeared on a documentary about him as a Benjamin Harrison enthusiast and I got like a jacket with Benjamin Harrison's face on it and I didn't have much information about him I was just like I because the post of this podcast called presidential and they were like we want people yeah. in the building who are enthusiastic and I'm like I'm very enthusiastic about Benjamin Harrison I want to know more and I got to learn a lot about him because we went to like the library of congress and we got to see all of this cool papers and like all the condolence notes that he'd gotten when his wife died from like Queen Victoria and such but then people were like are you a Benjamin Harrison expert I'm like I would love to be a talking head but I cannot guarantee you any level of expertise but it turns out the downside with establishing your credentials in this area is that there's really no market for Benjamin Harrison uh expertise anywhere plus like the actual experts have it handled they've got it pretty well under control even the apostles well, no there are like there are no Harrison experts <laughs> and um, so there's this series, you know, they're like presidential biography series, and um, they could not get anyone to write about the Harrisons. And so they realized that Gail Collins was from the same state, and that was the only connection they had. So they were like, hey, Gail Collins. And she wrote this 150 page, you know, mini biography on it. And she went home. Um, because in fact, th that was true. She was from there. She went home and she, uh, to investigate the scene where the Harrison family plantation once was that had been raised. And she was explaining this to her dad. And she says, dad, which I love. She was explaining this to her dad. And um, I know this because by the way, I, I interviewed her for presidents or people too. So you can hear her say it straight and well and not in this way but she um was explaining this to her dad this is totally irrelevant um and he's and she was explaining it used to be there and he said oh i know and she was like how do you know because he worked for the phone company so she wasn't quite sure you know why he was like up on this and he said that they there was the the word on the dirt road was that they were going to declare the harrison home a um a landmark 
and it had that's how unpopular this again presidential dynasty like the bushes no one cares it wasn't even an actual landmark and his her father was sent out there to quickly raise it so they could put down lines before <laughs> that happened and so that that was an interesting relationship so she wow. you know you could replace her um as as this uh as the expert i totally believe that um okay now we're definitely gonna turn to everyone else i'm sorry for being so selfish but i think you understand no uh, it, anything <laughs> harrison time is good time yeah i mean he yes absolutely uh, what do you think has permanently um, or long term changed due to Trump's administration? Not things like the courts, although that is probably one of the longest term things, yeah. um, but culture, expectations, what's going to stay normalized? That's from Tom. Ooh, that's a good question. I, my hope is nothing. <laughs> like the optimist in me wants to be like, none of this will stay normalized, but. I guess sort of hopefully what it will point out at least and, and like I don't know if normalize is the right word but like it's sort of the quintessence of the idea that like hey if I were just good enough at like the being on tv parts of running for president maybe I could win election like that whole theory of like it's just sort of this weird horse race with like no stakes that from which I feel like Trump really benefited hopefully what will change is people will see that that approach is bad and stop doing it that way but i don't know because looking into this election so far it feels a little less like that because there's just been so much more actual news going on and so people have been talking about like the actual news as opposed to like well how's it gonna play because it's like you can't talk about like thousands of people losing their lives as like a how's it gonna play type thing or at least i hope you can't maybe the people will disappoint me uh but so yeah i think hopefully that's something that will not stay the way that it is. I'm trying to think, well, maybe not having a first pet. I don't know. Or like, or being like yeah. a person who isn't like, a, like a, a divorced person. Although I guess that's, that's been, that's happened before. I'm trying to think of like a pleasant thing. Well, I think never doing this again. Yeah. <laughs> is pretty pleasant. I think um, some sort of uh, track record of service is what you're also indicating. Someone who, who has uh, some uh, level of I, empathy, humanness, uh, cares, any of those things, right? Those are yeah. all good. Um, Diana wants to know, you sort of already answered this, but, but um, what books do you like to read for pleasure? So maybe since you talked about sort of what you're reading, what, what do you want to read? Ooh, well, I, what should we read for pleasure? I feel like we should, if, if people can catch up with me on the Count of Monte Cristo and we can all finish it together. Um, oh, and we should also read, of course, yes, uh, my book. Um, I'm trying to think like, what's on my to read list? I, I made one, I can look at it. Um, I wonder oh, you keep that makes sense. Not on Goodreads. Oh, yeah, no. Well, I wanted to read uh, Benvenuto Cellini's autobiography because it just sounded like he was another bad man telling on himself. And I very much enjoyed Rousseau's. And everyone's like, well, if you like that, you'll like this. Um, and I've never read Parable of the Sower. And I want to read Parable of the Sower because I've been like off sci fi for a while. And I want to uh, get back on that. Um, Although my, I've also never read Dune and my husband's like, you gotta read Dune. But I'm like, I don't know, I, I'll get to it when the movie. Um, and the, I, I've never read The Social Contract. That's also on my list of things to read. Um, and Tale of Genji, I've never read. So I want to read that. Yeah, these are books I've been meaning to read and Other Voices, Other Rooms, which I've also not read yet. Uh, so those are my top five next books because I've just been sitting around and I haven't physically bought any books since this, uh, if, well, if, except for Count of Monte Cristo because once War and Peace was done, I treated myself. Um, but other than that, I've just been like working through what's in the house. And I'm like, I don't, I, I finished all of Somerset Mom and I'm like, there's got to be more. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Oh, that's funny. I also have been like hungering for sci-fi lately. And I think maybe made a mistake. Um, on the drive, uh, we're on vacation sort of. And um, on the drive here, my husband and I listened to Kindred. Oh, Octavia. no. 
<laughs> and I remember this from, I remember, Great like, I book, remember, but that doesn't sound like a cheerful drive. No, and like the babies in the back. <laughs> and yeah, I, I had remembered it was quite traumatic, but I was, everything, I'm just like, oh no, oh God, please no. But yeah, so sci-fi is great, but like, you know, well, well planned sci-fi. Yeah. Um, okay, another one from Philip. Have you figured out what the secrets, capitalized secrets, in the pineapple of hospitality are yet? Oh, Phil, hi, yay. Um, I think that pineapple of hospitality secrets must go to the, its pineapple grave with it. And I, I, I won't delve into them. I owe the pineapple that respect. Um, the nature's hedgehog must, must keep to its, its contents to itself. <laughs> um, I have to connect this to George Washington. When he took his only trip abroad to Barbados, as you know, he tasted avocados and pineapple and um, sugar cane slavery. And the only one that really registered with him was pineapple. He said, nothing pleases his taste as much as the pine. The literal. I wonder if you um, have a tingling sensation that you sometimes have when exposed to pineapple. Um, or does that mean that you're mildly allergic? Either way. Um, rocked his world. Yeah. Um, Tom would like to know, um, I know you've written a play. Can you write Benjamin, with Harrison, the Broadway musical in, um, in the Hamilton vein about... <laughs> about B. Harrison, then he went on, and then smiley face with the notes. I feel like, I, just, just, I was so busy asking myself whether I could write that musical that I didn't stop to consider whether I should write that musical. And I feel like the first answer is yes. And the second answer is, hmm. <laughs> but I mean, like, I feel like every, in the, the you could do like a theater for young audiences musical about like the opossums in his life. I, I feel like he was surrounded by many animals to a large extent that many presidents weren't like, until you get to like Roosevelt, who's got yeah. a wild menagerie going on. You don't really have, he's got like a goat named Mr. Whiskers or Old Whiskers. I, he's got all kinds of fauna. So maybe that would be your in. I'm not sure he could sustain a whole, you know, three hour extravaganza or that it would have mass appeal once completed but you know it's it's uh, no one thought that naming a cat after our 20th president would be a lasting comic strip and they were proven wrong i like it I like, do you write music as well or no but i i have like a a collaborator who composes we actually there's this like sort of mix and match speed dating for composers and lyricists workshop called the BMI music workshop, which I like uh, did for, and I'm still in now, uh, where they basically, they match you up with like, you go and you're like, I want to write lyrics. And somebody else is like, I want to compose music. And then they match you up. And every week you have like a new challenge where it's like, write a song for like this character from a book or like write a musical based on like, it's a wonderful life. And so, uh, and then at the end of it, you pick somebody and then you go through more challenges together. It, it was very, very fun. And so I am actually stealthily writing a musical based on a P.G. Woodhouse novel uh, called A Damsel in Distress. Although that, that's the title of the novel. The musical is called The Wrong American. Uh, and it's just sort of like classic mix-ups and love gone awry. But given that no one wants to go sit inside a building unsafely, uh, that's sort of on hold for the time being. I love that. Um, what What do you, and then the, the dreaded, what are you working on next? I mean, next I'm, I'm working on like, uh, just getting through the week. <laughs> I guess, honestly, like the part of my brain that like thinks about things in the future and is like, oh, I, I have lots of ideas and I want to write things because I always like want to write stuff. And the part of my brain is like, okay, now write something. That's the part of my brain that I feel like that's the one thing that sort of went. So I definitely want to keep working on stuff and like someday it might be fun to like do a TV show in like the wild undreamed of future or like write a novel or something. And I have some ideas, but I don't have the part of me that like sits down at the keyboard and is like, okay, good. Today, let's make it happen. So I'm just trying to keep 
trucking in the interim and hope that that yeah. will return. To get through this. And do you, uh, do you feel like um, creatively, it's pretty hard, even for someone who reads so much, both in you know book form and on the internet, it's hard when you're solely at home, when you can't go and interact with the world yeah. at all. And, and even if you're somewhat misanthropic or you keep to yourself, but if you can't go to the museum, if you can't go wherever, it is difficult, right? Like creatively, it's difficult, it's limiting. Even if you are inspired or you're outraged or whatever. Yes. Yeah. No, so I also keep being like, oh my God, I'm a, it's, is the experiences that I've had up to this point, is that like the sum total of all of the experiences I'm ever going to get to have? Like, you know, like w when do I get to start having like new experiences in new places, like with new people uh, that aren't like it's a me squinting hit. into my computer screen? Yeah, totally, totally. Um, Tom would like to know, did you contribute any puns to The Good Place given your connection to its pun writer? <laughs> That's some real inside knowledge there. Ooh, you know, I think my biggest help with that was like, well, she was like, D was there like a Greek lady who got torn apart by wild dogs? And I'm like, there absolutely was. This is where my classics major is finally cut, like half English, half classics, technically. Uh, but where all those years of studying classics is finally coming to fruition. There was one. And you can definitely put her in because she was cool and she did lots of math. Um, and so I, I felt like, I don't know that I contributed any successful puns, but I definitely was able to back up her knowledge of a real Greek person. Did you read um, Emily Wilson's translation? Yes, oh my God, so good. That introduction was amazing. Now I just want to ask you if you read every recent. Did you read Song of Achilles? Did you read? Like, I, I, read Song of Achilles. I haven't read Circe yet, but I, know I need to, because obviously everyone's like, well, you know, if you like one, you'll, you're gonna like, like the other. Definitely. Um, I actually really liked, I don't love listening to things, but I loved listening to that um, a lot. I thought it was great. Also, recently I've been listening to a lot of things. Such a funny age I loved listening to. Um, do you ever, do you just read or do you like listening to audiobooks? Do you listen to podcasts? I also, I do a lot of listening at second hand because my husband's obsessed with like listening to like lecture series and like when he finds like a good uh, podcast or lecture series, like he'll put it on. Uh, and I, I'll be able to like sort of hear it secondhand. So, and he, he like loves like the Wars of the Roses and uh, the Holy Roman Empire. Like I keep joking, we need to have theme days to like uh, keep our days from sort of blurring one into the next. And so I'm like, pizza day, we're gonna have pizza for breakfast. We're gonna have pizza for lunch and pizza for dinner. And he's like, Holy Roman Empire day. And I'm like, what are we gonna do? And he's like, I have no further information beyond the title of the day. Um, but I guess we'll celebrate Otto the first, not Charlemagne, because Otto the first was really the first one, and then we'll neither be holy nor Roman nor an empire, because that's what Voltaire said was true about the real empire. Um, and then we've been joking we need to have Romance Day, but that's because we've been watching a lot of Murder, She Wrote on Hallmark, which is the other thing. Uh, we've been, uh, yeah. Love some Jessica Fletcher. She's, like, there's other models for solving crimes. That's all I'm saying. You just, you don't need officers in uniform solving every crime. So you can have a mild-mannered retired widow lady and she can do it. And like, it works out. It works out for the communities. But Agreed. and like a public code, code, everyone's getting murdered all of the time. But once they solve that problem. But I mean, it's far better than cops. So like, why are people even making a big deal out of that? We should just, turn to murder she wrote. That should then be pushed forward as our model. Yeah, no, you gotta think about other ways. Yeah, look, look for alternative solutions. And Jessica Fletcher is one alternative. I'm Except gonna wait. 22 people die around her every year. That's a lot of people. It's, those are questionable numbers. Um, I'm not making accusations, but it's interesting. It's interesting. Um, I I'm waiting. The most unrealistic element of the show, I think, is that she has like hundreds of friendships that she's maintained over the course of years. So she'll, she'll always show up and she'll be like, my friend from camp, whom I've stayed in touch with for decades. And I'm just like, I envy you. Like that's, that's incredible stamina. I always intend to keep up with people and then like years pass and I'm like, oh, I, you know, instead of sending them the perfect text later, I should have sent them the shitty text then or crappy text or bad text. I don't know what our language rating is. 
during <laughs> Jeopardy could be on at the same time. We don't know what the prime time is. Do you um another good another good model I thought about is uh, this is just totally off topic, but Miami Vice is a decent example of a cop show, and they solve thirty five major cases in a month. Like they're always doing undercover work for years every single month on all these cases their productivity is through the roof um they don't chokeholds are not a thing i've never seen pepper spray they're both detectives and street cops it's a good model see i've never seen miami vice i knew that there was a movie with colin farrell and jamie fox and i missed Maybe. that um, i saw every single episode of this terrible show but i never saw the movie no i've seen blue bloods and i'm like this does not seem accurate, uh, but like it, 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 this. This just seems bad. But I have not seen Miami Vice, so if if it's nothing like Blue Bloods, then maybe it's a good model. It's definitely. I wouldn't suggest it, but it is a thing I have spent time on. Um, I, last question: Is there, you know, on book tour, even a virtual book tour? Um, I mentioned, I sort of alluded to this at the beginning where I made you awkwardly answer all those questions at once. Um, we get asked the same questions over and over again. And they're always the questions you wish that you had been asked um, or that you would like to talk about. So are there any of those things? Are there, are there any questions that you think are interesting because you keep getting them and they're kind of the wrong questions or are there questions you do wish you were getting? Is there something else that you would like to talk about that you want people to really focus on in the book or with your work or whatever it is? This is your, your moment. Here are the books. Oh, maybe yeah, the dealer's choice question. It's funny, I feel like the question I'm always like, I should be better prepared for this question because this too is a question that I get. But I, I really enjoyed this because it felt like a, a conversation where I just got to yell about books and that's one of my favorite things to do. Uh, yeah. But uh, I'm trying to think. I guess uh, one question people always ask is like, how do you do satire during these times? And my answer would be, buy the book and find out. Yes. <laughs> but, well, what's in it? Like, that's what they always want to know. And you're like, this is how you find out. I would suggest <laughs> buy this book. It's very, very good. I would suggest that you buy it from the book Smith SF yes. um, and uh, continue to read Alexandra's column, which occurs five times a week, except when she goes on vacation, which I think we all agree she should have, um, as well as universal healthcare and preschool and all these other great things. Um, this was an absolute pleasure. I'm a super fan and I tried not to make it too awkward and obvious, um, but this is wonderful and I think we all just want to thank you for the work that you do and that you give us books and articles to read and um, I know it, it must be difficult and it is, you know, everyone asks you this because we appreciate your work so much and it helps us get through this time. Oh, well, thank you and thank you for your book as well. Everybody read about George Washington. You never forget your first, which is Alexis's. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining us. And again, our new book, buy it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, thanks Alexis, thanks Alexandra. And congratulations on your book. This was really lovely. Um, to those of you watching at home, thanks for joining us. I uh, hope we can all meet in person uh, sometime soon. Um, until then, uh, booksmith.com, order the book and uh, we'll ship it right to you. Um, thanks again for joining us, you guys.